Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here with the Bill of Rights Institute, and we are here for another evening of A Push Review. We are going to be here uh, tomorrow as well at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. We're gonna take Friday and Saturday off for the weekend. Then we're gonna come back on Sunday and have five review sessions Sunday through Thursday. So this is the place to be. If you haven't subscribed to the Bill of Rights Institute YouTube channel, be sure to do that here, okay? So with this, uh, this is the third of nine sessions. This session is going to focus on the Articles, the Constitution, and uh, the Early Republic as far as the first two-party system. So with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and start uh, getting, uh, you know, taking questions, and then I'll be going into, uh, into some other things here. Now, let me see if the Bill of Rights Institute, uh, yeah, so the actually looks like here uh let's see we need to oh you know what i let me just uh let me just see i might not have given the correct link let me make sure that i've given the link to the google document that i'm going to refer to um, if i might not have sent the right link it looks like that went to a youtube address okay so let's go ahead and send that all right let me go ahead and send that link to the google document to the bill of rights institute and we'll go ahead and get that out there. Okay, so I'm going to be looking at a Google Doc. I'm going to show you all this that I'm going to, uh, you know, call this a push open notes. Okay, so I'm thinking about uh, making a series of review sheets uh, that we're going to call open notes. Uh, it's something just to, uh, you know, kind of put some, you know, I'm, my design is to make something that we're going to be able to, uh, you know, possibly, you know, use for reference on your exam if you feel like you need open notes or something like that. So that's something that I want to share with y'all. So we're going to be looking at this in just a second. And it looks like a lot of you are already in here. So excellent. So we've got several of you that are already in here. And we're going to get into, as I said, some uh, some open notes here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into our open notes and, you know, insert logo and all of that, uh, all of that kind of good stuff there. All right, so let's see. Okay, we've got everything that we uh, that we need, and let's go ahead and get started. And remember your questions. Send your questions to me. We'll make sure to get to those. Okay, so getting into um, these areas that are going to be important and important for us to go into. All right, so no, I don't want anything there. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'll fix the formatting and all that a little bit later. So going into that, let's go ahead and get into the main points of this period. Okay. So going into that, let's see, open up our screen share. And remember, when you've got questions, go ahead and ask, and I'll be checking the questions now and then. Okay, so let's go ahead and start our, let's see, let's get on the screen. All right, so here we go. Let's share the screen and okay so we'll uh get that minimize that make sure to close unnecessary tabs and applications all right so with that let's ah oh, come on come on come on no 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 okay so i want to get my okay i'm trying to uh no okay sorry this uh zoom is uh being a little bit uh little bit ornery right now. Okay, so let's go ahead and get the uh, get the zoom going again. Sorry about the technical difficulties here. I think we are finally sharing our screen. Okay, so a few things that we want to get into first of all. Okay, so we want to think about the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. Now, a tip here is if you're using open notes, if you're deciding to use notes on your APUSH exam, I would typically not recommend a lot of narrative in your notes. I would not recommend paragraphs and that sort of thing. I would be recommending things that are going to be queued up here. So when we're thinking about the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, then we need to think about a few things. First of all, what did the Articles and the Constitution have in common? So if we're thinking about, you know, I've, I've had a DBQ out there we've gone over before um, in some session or another, the Constitution and political change, okay? So so with the Constitution and political change, to what extent did the Constitution bring about political change in the United States? And for that, we need to think about the continuities and the discontinuities from the Articles to the Constitution. So with that, um, we see here, first of all, 
federalism, okay? So the articles of the Constitution both include central governments and state governments. And what we want to note here is that the state governments are more than regional governments. Fed central and state governments divide sovereignty, okay? That basically state governments have their powers, the federal government has its powers, and then there are powers that are concurrent between the two. Foreign policy, there's really not any difference between the Constitution and the Articles when it comes to foreign policy. Declare war, may, you know, create an army and navy, ambassadors, treaties, all of those things are handled by the federal government in both the Articles and the Constitution. Now, the other thing we want to note here is republicanism. Now, when I put republicanism in, these, uh, in this context, I always like to use a small r because we want to remind ourselves we're not talking about the Republican Party. It's kind of like when Jefferson said, oh, oops, uh, my, my tea bag got like all caught and just uh, flew out of there. Like I had this little wickerwork chair over there and uh, my little thing got caught here and it did like a flip, like, ac like tea acrobatics or something like that. Okay, so going from there, but everything's okay now. All right, so when we're talking about this form of republicanism, it's like when Jefferson said, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. He's not talking about the party, but saying that we all believe in a Republican form of government, that we all believe in the principle of Federalism. So Federalism is this idea that the states have their own powers, and then Republicanism, this idea that the people govern through their representatives, and there's not a monarch. And so then we go on to the differences. Now, first of all, we see here where under the articles, the states control trade exclusively, okay? So whether it was interstate commerce, whether it's trades with trade with foreign countries, every state control its own trade. Now, remember the context here. When we think about the context of the Articles of Confederation, we need to think about that this is in the midst of the American Revolution, okay? So when we're thinking about the context, okay? So the context, contextualizing the Articles of Confederation. So when we're contextualizing the Articles of Confederation, we need to understand that uh, the United States, uh, United States had just declared their independence from Britain, okay? So they had just declared their independence from Britain. They agreed to a loose, uh, you know, they, they agreed to a loose association of states, right? So a loose, so, you know, a loose confederation. So they agreed to, uh, you know, to the Articles of Confederation, which united them for, you know, so basically united them in the, in the context of when we're thinking about in matters relevant to the war, okay? So to the Revolutionary War. Um, so we see here, this is kind of like, you know, think that it is a military alliance, okay? So the Revolutionary War, but remained sovereign, okay? So united them, so they agreed, but uh, maintained the sovereignty of each state in all internal matters, okay? So, so, or we would say nearly all because we want to be careful about saying all. So, independence from Britain, okay? So, uh, so, Ameri you know, so Americans um, had just, uh, had just experienced tyranny in the form of, uh, you know, in the form of military occupation. And restrictions, so basically, uh, you know, and restrict and, you know, military occupation, uh, you know, tax taxation without consent. And the control of their trade 
uh, an outside government okay now notice what i'm doing here that we are putting when we're thinking about contextualization it's it's asking where did the articles come from okay so what is it that's really behind the articles why would they not give this new government the power to tax because that really does seem uh seem kind of uh kind of odd to create a government that doesn't have taxation power so we want to understand that this is the context of American independence from Britain. And so we see here where the states continue to control trade. Meanwhile, the federal government controls foreign trade and interstate commerce. Now note here that the states continue to control intrastate commerce. So the states control commerce within a state. And this, of course, goes all the way to the New Deal. Some of y'all may remember the Schechter Poultry Corporation versus the United States case, where we see that the Supreme Court says that New Deal measures have gone too far in regulating the commerce of the states. And so here uh, we see that under the article, states retained all taxing powers okay so then we see that they that the congress has the power to collect taxes so both federal and state governments can tax okay so federal and state governments can tax now remember the context here for the articles the abuses of power and control of trade by parliament now the context for the u.s constitution was that shay's rebellion okay is uh you know has persuaded a lot of elites that a stronger central government was necessary so the articles of confederation served their purpose because the united states did win the war but after the war uh, the economy was in shambles shay's rebellion uh there really was the united states was not respected by other powers and so this is something that we see in terms of building context for the constitution and so let's go ahead and see what questions are coming in here all right uh so are there so as far as are there moderates at the constitutional convention so one thing to note james if we're thinking about this that we've really i would say that you would probably consider most people at the constitutional convention moderates in the sense that they agreed with the principle of federalism but they wanted a stronger central government so i would look at somebody like james madison the father of the constitution you know james madison like oh what a cute little constitution give it a bottle all right and so james madison the father of the constitution james madison is someone who believed in the principle of federalism that there should be a federal republic with powers for the states and the central government but at the same time Madison did not believe in Hamilton's plan. Now, Alexander Hamilton at the Constitutional Convention actually put out a plan um, that would have, what this plan would have done is that it would have consolidated all the states into a unitary or national government. Um, and it would have made the states into regional governments and deprived them of all their power. Now, this is why, you know, after the ratification of the Constitution, Madison ends up going with Jefferson, even though he and Hamilton had, uh, you know, together with John Jay, they had gotten together to ratify the Constitution through writing the Federalist Papers. And so when you're looking at, at this, that when you think about Madison, Madison would be something of a moderate. Now, Hamilton put his view out there at the Constitutional Convention. He said, let's just get rid of the states. Let's have uh, you know, really build a national government. And the convention didn't even debate Hamilton's plan. So if there were people who agreed with Hamilton, they weren't saying anything. OK, and also we want to note that the framers at the Philadelphia Convention they're thinking about the realm of the possible, okay? So they wanted a stronger central government, but they still believed in their constituents believed. The people in the states still believed in strong state governments. The United States um, were, and note I'm using the plural here to go with that time, the United States were not ready to be considered a nation or anything like that, okay? So we don't at this time think of the United States as a nation, but rather a more perfect union union of states. So that's something here when we think about moderates. Yes, there were lots of moderates at the Constitutional Convention. And you think
think in terms of also the great compromise of the Constitutional Convention. So we want to understand the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan, okay, where James Madison is presenting the Virginia plan, which is something that is uh, the Virginia plan is, of course, the large state plan, which was going to create a two house legislature that was a portion based on uh, based on population in both houses, not just one. OK, so population in both houses. And so then you've got the New Jersey plan that basically is going to, uh, you know, be for, you know, the New Jersey plan was essentially let's just continue the articles. OK, so let's just continue the articles of confederation in terms of let every state have equal representation in Congress. Okay, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, let's get into, uh, you know, you made a document of key terms from class. Um, do I think that would be useful for the test or not too much? Now, if it's labeled by time period for easy navigation, I think that that's good, Emily. I'm starting to turn attention as we're getting into the week before the exam. I'm starting to think about what do open notes look like, okay? So we do want to talk about that. So what I've got here, when you think about something like this, now what I would do for with any notes, I would unless you're thinking okay i can easily search this i would have all of the open notes printed and in one place okay and i would have them in chronological order what i would not do for open notes i would not use my notebook uh, now emily if working you know if making a document and searching it would be good for you if that works that could be great now what I think I'm a little bit old fashioned in this sense, perhaps, but what I would think is we want to any any sheets that you've got that you're thinking I may use these for notes on the exam. You want to make sure that the notes are brief again, not having a lot of paragraphs or narratives or anything like that. And then thinking about like putting it all in chronological order. So that way, if it's about reconstruction, for example, okay, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to go to the next thing. Now, for example, ladies and gentlemen, on my Twitter, speaking of reconstruction, on my Twitter at Tom Ritchie, there is a brand new um, on my Twitter, there is a brand new DBQ that I have written on the social effects of reconstruction. So if you go to my, uh, if you go to my Twitter, then you'll be able to see um, this new DBQ on reconstruction and social change. Okay, so reconstruction and social change, um, which is, uh, which is something that I think will be helpful. So if you want to download that, just go to my Twitter at Tom Ritchie. I've just put that out there. Um, so with that, as we go on, let's keep our dialogue going, Emily. And you are more than welcome to contact uh, me through my website. Just fill out the contact form on my website and put a link um, to this document that you're talking about. Make sure you note that I asked you to get in touch with me. So, uh, so the person that checks my email will send that, you know, those forms will send that directly to me. And, uh, you know, I'd love to see that and give you some pointers on that. So with that, but yeah, we will be looking at that, especially as we get into next week's broadcast what do open book open notes what do these open notes look like okay so raul you're asking here how would someone evaluate the importance of the causes of the revolution okay so when we're thinking about that role what we've got to think about here that um, you know, when we're thinking about the causes of the American Revolution, um, if it's asking you to go into the relative importance of the causes, which that's what we did in the um, in the DBQ clinic that we did, if you'll look through our previous broadcast with the Bill of Rights Institute on the Bill of Rights Institute YouTube channel, by the way, if you haven't subscribed, make sure to hit that subscribe button to subscribe to the Bill of Rights Institute. So with that, you want to think about in terms of the different causes, okay? The different causes are going to be, they're going to have to do with taxation without representation, control of trade, troops in the colonies, British tyranny in general, ideas like or traditional ideas and the enlightenment okay so those are some things you're basically putting the documents into those bigger arguments but i did go through how to set up that dbq on a previous clinic that we did here with the bill of rights institute 
So with that, let's go ahead, you know, let's see whatever things we've got. Let me just look at the chat real quick. Amari, I think that that is a great idea if you think in terms of limiting your notes. I would say you can possibly go for a page front and back. Um, that if you think about like, okay, we've got you, we've got 1754 to 1945. And I would think in terms of that, that you could have, uh, I would say you go through the Civil War and you, you know, you may basically go through the Civil War on page one. Um, and then um, go start with reconstruction on page two. So if we're thinking in terms of this, uh, you know, let me, I may do something that's very risky. I don't know what we, you know, if this is maybe too risky, if we were thinking about a, you know, if I were thinking about opening this up so that people, it's probably not a good idea to open this up on a public broadcast, but let me go ahead and put a two pager. Okay. So when we think about a two pager, uh, you know, a two pager open book, uh, you know, a two pager open notes. Okay. So with that, and I'm not going to share this right now, I'm just going to kind of go into what this might look like. Okay. Um, so, so going into that, let me, let me just get into a few more questions here. The articles gave the government's no power over all to be Okay, well, here's the thing, Emily, that we want to note with the articles, we don't want, I mean, there's a temptation just to focus on the failures of the articles. And so what you want to, uh, what you want to focus on is, you know, not just the failures of the articles, but there are some ways in which the articles are um, the articles are affected. The articles won the war, okay? So we see that the Revolutionary War uh, was a victory, okay? So with the help of the Articles of Confederation, a little bit of luck and some French assistance, uh, we won the American Revolutionary War, okay? So that's one thing. Now, another thing we want to note is one of the best uh, examples of a um, one of the best examples that we would have of a something of an achievement of the Congress under the articles is they did, the states did cooperate in order to yield the states that had Western land claims in what is today the Midwest, which used to be the Northwest um, between the Ohio River and the Mississippi River. In that area, all of the states gave up their territorial claims and they reserved that area for the creation of new states. And that was, of course, done under the Articles. That's known as the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. So when we're thinking about the Articles of Confederation, that's something that we want to uh, that we want to note that the the that the you know when they when they wrote the Articles of Confederation, they gave the government the powers that it needed to fight a war and nothing more. We want to think about the Articles of Confederation as a military alliance. I think that that's going to be the best way to think about the Articles of Confederation, um, that we're thinking about this as a military alliance. Okay, so think of the Articles as a military alliance. And when you think of it like that, you're thinking, okay, they're not trying to create a nation, they're just trying to create an alliance. And so when you think about that, it's something like NATO, for example, which isn't going to be on the exam, but this is an alliance the United States is part of. And it's, it's a situation where NATO can't really compel all of its members to be in compliance with all of its directives. Some members are going to be more in compliance than others. But at the same time, NATO is not, uh, you know, it's, it's not a nation. It, it is a military alliance. So, all right. So then I see nothing about Virginia and New Jersey plans and the Great Compromise. OK, I would say here, Eric, that just because something's excluded here doesn't mean that it's not important. OK, so I just was putting stuff down here. Uh, let's go ahead and note here. OK, so we want to note something about the Philadelphia Convention. Right. OK, so the Philadelphia Convention. Now, I think that when you think about this, the Constitution, it is important to note some things about the Constitution, not necessarily in the depth that you're going to need in AP government, okay? So not necessarily with that kind of depth, 
But the Philadelphia Convention, when we're looking at the Philadelphia Convention, uh, what we're thinking about here is, uh, you know, we've got a few different things here. So, yeah, let's make sure to, to note that. But, yeah, the exclusion of something on here doesn't mean that it's not important or that people don't need to know it. I'm just trying to create some, uh, some things here that will be helpful. Okay, so first of all, we want to think in terms of the Virginia plan. Okay, so we're going to we're going to get started here with the Virginia plan. Okay, and then New Jersey plan. Okay, so basically this was the large state. Okay, so the large state plan. Okay, so would have created a bicameral legislature. With, with, you know, with representation determined by population. Okay, so we see here would have created a bicameral legislature with representation determined by population um, of each, by each state's population. So that is known as the large state plan. Now remember, Virginia was the largest uh, state uh, at that time. So the New Jersey plan, okay, so what I'm going to do here is just reformat this just a little bit. Okay, so this is the large state plan. Okay, so that's the Virginia plan. Now the New Jersey plan, okay, so we're going to uh, note here, actually, you know what, let me just do this. No, 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 don't, don't. No, okay. The New Jersey plan, get it? This is the... Don't, don't. They think they're doing me a favor. They're not. Okay, so the New Jersey plan, the small state plan. Okay, so the Virginia plan would have created a bicameral legislature with representation determined by a, each state's population. Whereas the New Jersey plan, okay, this is the uh, this is the small state plan, okay? So when we look at the New Jersey plan, we're looking at the small state plan, and this would have preserved uh, the, the equal representation, okay? So equal representation of states in a unicameral legislature. Okay, so would have preserved the equal equal representation, so equal representation of states, okay, in a unicameral legislature, basically just like the Articles, okay, so this is the Articles of Confederation, uh, you know, part two. And remember that the purpose, okay, that remember that the stated purpose, okay, so the stated purpose of the Constitutional Convention was to amend the Articles, okay? So really, the New Jersey plan is coming from the perspective, from the point of view of people who come from a smaller state, and they're saying, look, that I, you know, we came over here to amend the Articles. That's the impression we were under. And then there is the so-called Great Compromise, okay? So this is where, you know, we want to understand the Great Compromise, Okay, so the Great Compromise, um, and of course the Great Compromise, the essence of this is that the Senate, okay, so the Senate will be, uh, or wait, the House of Representatives, because that will go with the Virginia plan. Okay, lower house. Okay, so the lower house will be apportioned, you know, will be apportioned do you know by population okay so we'll be apportioned by population the upper house so the senate will have equal you know will have equal representation for all states okay so basically remember two each all right so we've got two each and that is of course the great compromise now not henry clay not the great compromiser but the great compromise okay so another compromise was the three-fifths compromise so the three-fifths compromise which uh you know which counted slaves for three-fifths of a person in return for Congress having the authority to uh, abolish 
the slight sort of outlaw, well, we won't use the term abolish um, because that's going to confound with abolitionism, but outlaw the slave trade. Okay, so basically to outlaw the slave trade in 20 years, okay, which Congress did. Okay, so that's another thing about the Philadelphia Convention. And the big takeaway from the Philadelphia Convention is we want to understand that the Constitution was a product of compromises okay so we have a few things that we want to uh we want to note here that the constitution that was produced in philadelphia was one one was a product of several compromises and two did not include a bill of rights okay so those are some things there that i would that i would note here okay so that's what we could say about the constitution but yeah the the exclusion of anything on this document as you can see i've just added something here and i'm trying to put this in kind of a chronological reference uh, it may be okay to have this uh to have this there okay so this is something i want to note a specific question that i got from somebody about using google is google allowed okay technically internet searches are allowed anything that does not involve other people is basically fair game okay now a lot of people haven't seen lord of the rings that's your own problem okay i like to make lord of the rings references okay so when we think about that what i'm going to tell you though if you haven't seen lord of the rings just understand the ring is evil okay so first the ring gives you some powers like to make you invisible second of all the ring is evil okay and you don't want to put it on for long or it's going to corrupt you and destroy you so when we think about this what we've got to think about when we're when we're thinking about whether to google or not um approach google like you would approach the one ring okay one ring to rule them all that when the riders are coming uh then frodo's like whoa i gotta put the ring on and frodo puts the ring on and then he gets invisible he can get away but it's like this evil's going on all around him and then as soon as the danger is passed frodo you got to take it off okay you got to take the ring off so the thing is what i would say here as far as google treat google like the one ring that only put it on if you really need to just for a second and then take it off okay and i would probably say to do this later and the main thing here okay the main thing here is to is to propose questions that can be answered in one word okay it, you know propose questions that could be answered in one word so with that something like this okay so if i were to type here who wrote the who wrote the virginia plan i'm still in all caps okay so and then i would do the autocomplete right but i, I kind of like my own all caps who wrote the virginia plan and google says chase Anderson. all right and so this is the type of thing where i would say if it's something you know don't click on this okay don't click on it don't read about it the only time i would recommend google is if you've got a question like that where you're just like who wrote the virginia plan and that's all that there is to it so who wrote the virginia plan and then you're going to get a one word kind of answer okay so then you know we think about uh you know we think about this in terms of you know what was uh, you know, so so I wouldn't ask complicated questions here. OK, so that's something that I think is very important. You know, who were the people who opposed the Constitution? OK, so who are the people who opposed the Constitution? Anti-Federalist. OK, so we see here anti-Federalist. So that's something that is uh, that is very important here. Oh, oops, kicked my camera. Sorry about that. And so anti-federalist. But other than that, I would not use Google. And again, treat Google like Frodo would treat the one ring. OK, so that's something that is important here. So as far as that goes, Olivia, make sure that if you're going to Google something, you do it quickly. You don't do it in a way it's going to take time. And only in a case like, you know, how you're like, gosh, who was that? Was that? Hamilton or Madison that wrote the Virginia plan, who was, you know, you don't want to sit there thinking about it. If you can quickly Google and you can see that, it's like, okay, moving on. But again, don't read, limit the amount of notes that you have available. And if you're Googling Google only for like, 
I'm forgetting something. You'll notice that I do that when I'm broadcasting sometimes. I'm like, wait, what year was that or something like that? Now, the other thing when I'm asking what year was that, make sure that this is, uh, you know, that this is something that is, you know, that let's make sure that it's something that is critical. Like you don't need to necessarily like something we wouldn't Google. We wouldn't ask how many people were killed during the Boston massacre. OK, that's something that you're like, you know, some colonists were killed. Uh, you know, one of my one of my clients wrote like 340 chests of tea. OK, were dumped into the Boston Harbor during the Boston Tea Party. And the thing is, your reader's not going to be like extremely impressed with you saying 340 chest of tea on something that's Googleable. Now, if this were standard exam conditions, then yes, okay. If it were standard exam conditions, then certainly, okay. But it's not, it's Googleable. So don't get too deep into the weeds, okay. Make sure that you're making your points. Evidence needs to be specific, but it doesn't have to be exhaustive. And remember, you're not necessarily going to impress somebody with like, ooh, look what I Googled. Um, so so the thing is, yes. Uh, now, as far as that goes, uh, you know, let's see, um, let's see, uh, Aren, that when we're looking at these open, you know, you're welcome to print this Google document that I've shared. Now, will I have like a full and comprehensive set of open notes on every single topic? Probably not. Okay, but there will be some things that I will be making available before the exam and you are more than welcome. Anytime I share a Google Doc publicly, you can share the link, you can uh, print it, you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, so that's something I'm putting these out there um, in order to help. So do we need to know, and James, I think I noted uh, that we, you know, the specifics about the Constitution, it depends on which specifics. I think that there's some overlap. The Commerce Clause, for example, the Commerce Clause is going to be uh, relevant to, um, you know, AP government and AP U.S. history, okay? So as far as that goes, uh, you know, just understand that there are some things that are uh, you know, that are, that are important here. Okay. So going with that. Okay. So going with that, uh, we are going to get into, uh, you know, get into this. Okay. So going from there, let's see what we've got here. So uh, what is the more, okay. Somebody saying something about Mordor now. Okay. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, that we go into, let's see, so is the five minutes, okay, so we've got a question here, is the five minutes we have to turn in our writing part of the 45 minutes or separate, okay, so when we're thinking about that, you know, part of the 45 minutes or separate, uh, this is where we want to, we want to think about uh, that it's five minutes that basically starts from what I understand. Now, again, I'm going to put a disclaimer on here. I'm not responsible for this. You are. Okay. But from what I understand, what's going to happen here is that it's a 50 minute time period, like, or 40, it's, it's total. You have 50 minutes all on one clock, but it's 45 minutes. And then from what I've, uh, what, from what I understand, a red light starts blinking at 45 minutes. So, which means that you've got time to finish your thought and just go over. You don't have a hard stop at 45 minutes, but I would consider 48 minutes to be a hard stop. I would not go into the 48th minute. When you see that you have two minutes remaining, I would not go to the brink, okay? Remember, brinkmanship is not on the exam. The Cold War is not going to be on the exam. Brinkmanship is not on the exam. So let's be sure that we that we note that. Okay. So brinkmanship is not on the exam. So from, from there, we want to understand that at minute 48, I would say if you have not turned in your work yet, you need to. Don't push that into the 48th or the 49th minute. I think that that, is, uh, that that would be a mistake, okay? So so with that, all right, thanks, Sean Patrick is, uh, is here with us again. Always uh, glad to see you here. All right, so another broadcast in terms of washing. Oh, you know, I'll do that. Uh, I'll do that today, okay? So, uh, you know, Eric, when, when you ask me about my, you know, so my terms, okay, so Washington's farewell address, when I get out there, 
um, we're going to, uh, we'll get there. So let me go into a little bit more here. So going into ratification, all right? So a few things here, let me share the screen with y'all here again. So the ratification of the Constitution, the Federalist versus the Anti-Federalist, okay? So what we see here is giving the central government more powers will create a tyranny with the Anti-Federalist, such as Brutus. Now, the Federalists, uh, you know, they want a stronger central government. They say it's necessary for a sound economy and a stable society. Now, what we want to note here is that the Bill of Rights was added, okay, so as a compromise. It's not part of the original Constitution, okay, so not part of the original Constitution as a compromise in order to gain the support of some anti-federalists. So this is something that's important uh, when we think in terms of uh, that the moderate anti-federalists came around on this uh, later on, but the Bill of Rights was not part of the original Constitution. And so then we want to think about, uh, you know, the you know, the first two party system, which for some reason, I don't know why I put that down here, but we're going to move this up a little bit. Okay, so Jefferson versus Hamilton, the first two party system. Now I've got some videos on this stuff as well. I've got a video on this uh, Jefferson versus Hamilton bit. Okay, so as far as that goes, we're looking at, er, okay, this map, I got this mouse last week. It's just, I, I'm not going to switch right now, but at some point, I think I'm either going to get used to it or I'm going to stop using it. Okay, so Jefferson versus Hamilton, the first two party, not tow party. So the first two party system, I'm telling you, I'm struggling to type right now. So when we think about this, Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. OK, so the Federalist Party and, of course, the Republican Party, which is referred to um, by several different, you know, by a couple different names. I prefer Jeffersonian Republican Party. I think the exam in its current incarnation uses Democratic Republican, even though they used to use Jeffersonian Republican, uh, which I think is uh, a bit more accurate. Um, so going into this, we want to be able to compare the first two parties, you know, the views of the first two party system. So the Jeffersonians are states' rights, whereas the Hamiltonians, the Federalists, are for a stronger central government. Now, note here that states' rights laissez-faire and strict constructionism and low taxes of opposition to a national bank. They all go to a less active federal government. Jefferson, said, Jefferson wrote to Madison after the first time he saw the Constitution, I'm not a friend of inner, a very energetic government. It is always oppressive. So when you look at Jefferson, he doesn't want the government to turn into a tyranny. Now, when you look at the Federalist Party, a stronger central government that should encourage domestic manufacturing, that believes in a loose construction of the Constitution that includes implied powers. Uh, revenue. So instead of low taxes, we see that they supported an excise tax on whiskey, which of course sparked the Whiskey Rebellion. They supported the National Bank. Uh, they were pro-British. Uh, they supported the Jay Treaty, whereas the Jeffersonians tended to favor the French and did not support the Jay Treaty. Now, Washington's farewell address, okay? So a few things about this, and I need to make a note, as somebody noted here, that I've said in some other broadcasts before that we want to think of note, okay? So Washington's farewell address, address, you know, we can think of this as, uh, you know, forms the cornerstone, you know, so basically the cornerstone of American foreign policy. Through World War II, okay? So this may, you know, this makes it fair game, okay? So fair game for contextualization or, you know, a variety of foreign policy prompts, okay? So when you think about this, a variety of foreign policy prompts can be contextualized. Now, not every foreign policy prompt, but there are lots of them. Like when I think about, uh, you know, for example, when we think about uh, the, the, the Versailles Treaty, 
Okay, when we're thinking about the Versailles Treaty, um, what we want to think about here is that a lot of the opposition to the Versailles Treaty is rooted in the principles of Washington's farewell address, the, um, the anti-imperialist league during the time of imperialism was motivated by the principles of Washington's farewell address. So basically understand here that Washington decided voluntarily to leave after two terms and was not going to seek a third term. So he's setting a precedent that lasted until FDR was reelected to a third term in 1940. All right, the second thing, so when we think about this, we want to understand the neutrality policy that the United States is not going to intervene in foreign wars, okay, especially not European wars. So we see with the world wars that the United States got involved in World War I, but at the same time, the United States was, uh, you know, was not uh, afterwards really proud of its involvement in World War I. They felt like they had been kind of led into it. So that's where you see the Nye report during the 1930s and the resulting neutrality acts, because a lot of Americans felt like they had been led into a European European war. So first of all, neutrality. So the principle of neutrality, I'm um, thinking about, uh, you know, feel thinking about that. So the neutrality policy, okay, so the neutrality policy. Now that is, you know, if we said here that, uh, you know, that also is, you know, quote, unquote, isolationism. Okay, so when we think about isolationism, um, the neutrality policy um, you know, that uh, re-articulated in Washington's farewell address. So the neutrality policy is, of course, you know, isolationism. Nobody ever says, hi, I'm Tom Ritchie and I'm an isolationist, all right? This is something you would say, like, I'm Tom Ritchie and I believe in the principle of neutrality. And then somebody who is more interventionist would say, Tom Ritchie is an isolationist, okay? One of those bad isolationist. So with that, uh, that just understand that isolationism is always, you know, it's typically going to be a pejorative term there. Okay. So then going into, well, before we go into the Adams administration, let's see if we've got any more questions. I think we've got a few questions that have come up and the more questions, the better. I enjoy the Q&A format. Uh, will there be a, re, you know, a way to copy and paste? Okay, so Peter, um, the College Board has informed us. Now, note simulations are available. So get into your AP Classroom College Board account. You should be receiving emails from the College Board. So will there be any way to copy and paste into the place we turn it in, or do we have to attach something? Um, from my understanding, you are allowed to type it in Google Docs and then copy or Word or whatever you want to use and copy and paste it into the uh, into the College Board thing. So you can you can type it directly from what I understand. Now again, this is the best of my understanding that we are looking at something that is, uh, you know, something that is you can type it in there right there, or you can copy and paste it into the box once you're finished if you don't trust the College Board, which who wouldn't trust the college board, uh, you know, for uh, for their technology to work, right? And so as far as that, with anti-federalist, uh, so, so yeah, if we thought about the two-party system, okay, so if we thought about the two-party system, uh, we would think about, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, yeah, the federalist and anti-federalist could be great contextualization because what we see here where a lot, now what we want to note here is, don't say what you don't want to fall into is falling into a trap where you say that anti-federalist all sided with Jefferson, federalist all sided with, uh, with Hamilton, because note that there were some people like James Madison who wrote the Federalist Papers, uh, that the Federalist and Anti-Federalist, these were not necessarily parties, these were strategic alliances for one thing. And so what you see here is the Federalist Party, they keep their they keep their name, but there is a bit of a reshuffling. But I think the ratification of the Constitution could be useful context. Now, again, we have to look at the prompt. Now, note here where I said Washington's farewell address is ready made contextualization for a variety of foreign policy prompts. I did not say that Washington's farewell address should be used as canned contextualization no matter what the prompt. And so going from there, uh, James is asking, what is the unwritten constitution? 
when we're talking about an unwritten constitution, we're talking about things like Washington's two-term precedent, that that was part of an unwritten constitution, that it was understood that somebody was going to, any president, no matter how popular, was going to step down after two terms. And then um, when we look at, uh, you know, we look at FDR. Now, FDR violated that unwritten constitution. FDR violated the two-term president. And once he did that, Congress decided after his death that they would put that two-term precedent into our written constitution. For, so for a long time, uh, the two-term precedent, which is nowhere in the constitution, was something that was an unwritten thing, okay? So it was unwritten, but then they put it into the written constitution. Remember, constitution is just basically describes our way of doing things in terms of government, okay? So with that, let's uh, let's go ahead and see what the chat's looking like here. Um, so, you know, yeah, so, so it looks like I've got the same understanding as other people. I just don't want to speak to uh, the, I just don't want to speak for the college board. I don't want to give you any information that's not true. Um, so the evolution of political parties. Yeah, I think that's important to know. So Amari, you're starting that right now by looking at the first party system, which starts during Washington's administration and continues through the War of 1812. But we definitely want to look at when we go forward, that might be our next broadcast. In fact, I think that we're going to be starting to look at that tomorrow as we get into uh, the period you know, of the era of good feelings and getting into this little in between this little period in between the second two party system and understanding how democracy really throws things off that you've got this period where we thought, you know, the party system is gone. And then as popular democracy comes in, we see a second two party system form. So uh, the Louisiana Purchase, now let's think about in terms of, let's not think about written and unwritten written constitutions versus strict and loose construction. Okay, so strict construction means that the powers of the federal government are only the enumerated powers, the powers that are listed. So the thing is that when you think about strict construction, only the enumerated powers. Now, when we think about the, uh, the implied powers, okay, so when we get into the implied powers, these are the powers that are, well, implied, like basically necessary and proper. Now, somebody who's a loose constructionist thinks in terms of proper. When Hamilton reads necessary and proper, he reads it for proper. When Jefferson reads necessary and proper, he reads it for necessary. Like, you know, the only time the government should go beyond these enumerated powers is when it's necessary. Hamilton's like, if it kind of goes along with those enumerated powers and there's nothing wrong with it, just go for it. That's Hamilton's view, but of course, Hamilton's view also increases the power of the central government. Now, Jefferson, during, while the Louisiana Purchase is being negotiated, Jefferson was having a hard time because he never saw it in the Constitution where it explicitly says that the president and Congress can add land to the United States. But the thing is, that is certainly directly implied when it says that the government has the power to make treaties, that we're adding land through a treaty with France, that purchasing land is part of a treaty. And so with that, that uh, Jefferson wanted a constitutional amendment specifically authorizing the government to purchase land. Now, Jefferson realized his, his colleagues and his party said, that's not going to happen. And so then Jefferson had to, uh, you know, had to regroup. Jefferson had to regroup in terms of, all right, well, I guess we're going to go ahead and purchase Louisiana because Jefferson believed that the, the republic, we could only continue as a republican form of government if we remained agrarian. So for Jefferson, the Louisiana Purchase is a way to make sure that the United States continues as an agrarian republic, which it will for a long time for several decades. So with that, uh, you know, we see here that uh, that we see that uh, the all right, interesting here. So uh, yeah, all right. So Ron Swanson in the chat there. All right. So with that, let me go ahead and go briefly into the Adams administration. Um, so the John that the Adams administration is really in a lot of ways the first partisan administration. Um, because Washington, now even though Washington did go with Hamilton a lot more than he went with Jefferson, uh, that Washington sometimes classified as a federalist. 
populist. Um, and maybe that's fair to an extent, but I would consider Washington nonpartisan. Now, John Adams is put out, you know, is put into the presidency with the help of the Federalist Party. OK, so the Federalist Party now controls uh, the machinery of government. And so during the Adams administration, Congress passes the Alien and Sedition Acts, which Congress passes these laws to extend the residency requirement for citizenship and remove undesirable aliens from the country. Now, so far, you may agree or disagree with these laws. You may see them as politically motivated, and they were, but it's constitutional. Keep in mind that all immigration policy is politically motivated. I mean, it just is. And so with that, you know, that's from either party. But now they also made it a criminal offense to criticize the government in print. So basically, Jefferson and Madison anonymously wrote the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions where they protested the uh, they protested the Alien Sedition Acts, and they both advocated for the compact theory of the Constitution, that the Constitution is a compact between the states, and the states have the power to interpret it. Whereas nullification, that's only Jefferson, and this is the idea that a state can unilater unilaterally declare a federal law void within its borders if the law violates the Constitution. And so that's something that Madison did not go so far as to say that that's the case. But Nat Madison believed that the states have the authority to interpret the Constitution and they have a right to what Madison called to interpose between the federal government and their citizens and to file a complaint. So with that, you see a little bit of a difference in Jefferson and Madison, but then at the same time that they're on the same page in terms of the general theory of the Constitution. All right, so with that, we are going to be looking at the Great Depression uh, you know, next week. I'm not gonna say that any of this is unimportant. I do think, I have said before that I think that you know, it is unlikely that the DBQ is gonna come from the 20th century. That's just me applying some POV analysis to the college board. But at the same time, I don't think that we want to discount those things, okay? So we do want to understand that anything between 1754 and 1945 is fair game, all right? So ladies and gentlemen, y'all want to make sure that you're following BRI students, okay? So we want to think about uh, BRI students and getting, you know, following them on Instagram. So I'm looking them up. Uh, what we see here is uh, we see a, you know, just a schedule of the webinars. This is the easiest thing that I can do here um, that, yes, we are going to be focusing next time, Thursday at 630 on the Jeffersonian Republic, 1800 to 1824. So that's going to be our focus area for next time. So we're going to go into unit four and we're going to go into uh, this period between 1800 and 1824. And then remember, we're going to take a couple days off. We'll be back Monday at 630 and then every night before the exam. So with that, make sure you're following BRI students on Instagram. Okay. So that's something that I think is very important for you. Um, follow BRI students on Instagram. I'm following them and you should. You're also welcome to follow me at Tom Ritchie if you are not already following me. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude our broadcast. Again, you're welcome to use uh, anything that I've shared. Uh, you're welcome to use it. So feel free, any kind of note sheet or anything like that, if it helps you, feel free to use it. So with that, I will, uh, yeah. all right, that's really funny, Olivia. And with that, we are going to go ahead and conclude. And it's always a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen.